Today we're going to take a look at the smallest liquid cooled build so far on the channel. Now we're no stranger to installing and testing all-in-one liquid coolers in small form factor cases. We've done this for the NCASE M1, the Ghost S1, the Streetcom DA2, and even the tiny Dan A4 SFX, which is one of my favorite liquid cool configurations to date. This time around, we're taking on the Sentry 2.0, which comes in at seven liters flat of total volume. And we're going to replace the loud, low profile Cryrig C7 copper cooler with a 120 mil AIO. Now we've already done a full review on the Sentry 2.0 where we looked at hardware compatibility, build quality, and also thermals. So if you're interested in getting a full grasp of this case, I'll leave that linked in the top right hand corner. Overall, it's a premium console sized PC case that can accommodate a high performance gaming system, perfect for your living room or minimal gaming setup. Otherwise, this video will solely focus on the liquid cooling abilities of this case, what you need to know before doing so, and whether I even recommend doing it over the air-cooled configuration that we used in the initial review. All right, so let's get right into it. The most important thing that you need to know for this configuration is that you will need to compromise a little on the graphics card. The 120 mm radiator occupies an area right next to your GPU. So whereas before the Sentry could accommodate a full length card, you're now restricted to just 175 millimeters in length. Now I do use the word compromise lightly here as you still can accommodate up to an RTX 2070, like the MSI Aero ITX that we'll be using today. It just means that you won't be able to use full length two slot RTX 2080s or 2080 Ti's. Next up, let's talk about the radiator and the fan. So in total, when we're talking about thickness, the Sentry 2.0 only allows for 50 millimeters of thickness when adding up the radiator and the fan. I'm using the Corsair H55, which has a 27 millimeter radiator. And on top of that, I'm using a 15 millimeter slim fan from Noctua, the NFA 12 by 15. So this gives us 42 millimeters of total thickness. So about eight millimeters of clearance from from the frame. And yes, I did try my best to squeeze in Noctua's NFA 12 by 25, which is currently the best 120 mm fan out there. But even by removing the anti-vibration pads, we're still at 52 millimeters of thickness and I just couldn't get it to fit. So the slim fan is what we're going with. It's an easy to use configuration and I have tested the fan both as push and pull against the radiator to see what's most effective. The radiator mounts via the ventilation holes on the side panel. So that's what you want to do first. And the one downside here is that the screws will be exposed and visible from the exterior. Once the radiator and the fan are in, you'll want to install your motherboard and then the rest of your components, just as you would with the original Sentry build. Now for the hardest part, and that's getting everything to actually fit properly. It's one thing to mount all of your hardware in such a small space, but to get it to fit elegantly so that you can actually get the side panels on is another beast entirely. The main concern here are the tubes on the AIO, as there's just not that much room inside the Sentry for them to be routed. You can try and let them overlap and force the side panel on, but good luck with that. If you're using the Corsair H55 like I am, I recommend squeezing both of the tubes through this little gap here and possibly zip tying them together to keep them in place. Overall, it's an incredibly tightly packed system with barely any room to move. The mini graphics card is basically touching the radiator, the power supply cables need to be squashed together, and getting the side panel on does require a bit of force. The only issue I ran into was from the power cables on the graphics card. So if you're using this exact card, I'd recommend using stock power supply cables, not sleeved ones, as that way you'll be able to bend them easier and not run into this bolt in the top panel. All right, so let's get to the thermals. So here we're using the diluted 8700K running at auto clock speeds with the power limit unlocked. This means that it boosts to 4.3 gigahertz across all cores. And as we can see, the Sentry 2.0 can now handle that with no problem at all with the liquid cooler. Previously, that setup just wouldn't have worked with the 47 millimeter tall air cooler, especially in a demanding load like Blender. We can also see that positioning the fan as pull against the radiator does work a bit better than push. So definitely keep note of that if you are planning on doing this build. CPU thermals are a bit better than the Dan A4 SFX when using a 92 mil liquid cooler. And considering that the Sentry 2.0 is a slightly smaller case, that's not a bad result at all. We're actually approaching CPU thermal results that you'd achieve with a beefy air cooler like the C14S or the U9S when used in an NCASE M1, and those setups often receive quite a lot of praise. Of course, these temperatures were with an 8700K at 100% utilization in an AVX workload. So if you're planning on using this setup for gaming, I think you'd easily get away with a five gigahertz overclock for this setup. 
Thermals for the mini graphics card were okay too. At full load, we were seeing around 75 degrees C at an ambient room temp of 20, with the boost clock sitting at 1750 MHz and then the fan RPM a little over 2000. Thermals could even be a bit better though if the area in the panel above the fan had some ventilation, as at the moment it is completely blocked. This means that the slim fan has to pull air through the radiator and then just kind of exhaust the hot air wherever. Surprisingly, the result is still pretty good, but again, it could be a bit better. So if you are planning on picking up the Century 2.0, this setup is definitely worth giving a go in my opinion, unless of course you're going with an RTX 2080 or a 2080 Ti, in which case you won't be able to find a mini graphics card for. Otherwise, the liquid cooler is miles ahead of what you can achieve, even with the high performance uh, Cryo Copper C7, where if you remember, we were getting a similar temperature result of around 62 degrees C, but with an i5-8400. The crowdfunding campaign for the Century 2.0 is currently underway, so if you do want to get your hands on one, I'll leave a link down in the description to their full campaign and also to my full initial review. As always, guys, a huge thanks for watching. Consider subscribing down below if you haven't already. And I'll see you all in the next one.